Today I don't have a camera guy, so I'm going to be the camera guy. So you're going to come along with me. It's going to be a little bit different, but we'll take care of it. Hey, I'm here with Jeff Pitt. He runs sound for... George Thorogood and the Destroyers. And the Destroyers. So pretty. Can you tell, start off by telling me about this console over here? Uh, this is Allen Heath D-Live S5000 as a surface of choice for this year's tour and last year. Uh, we'd been longtime Midas Pro 2 users and made the switch over to the D-Live scenario. Extremely happy with the uh, outcome and the availability of I.O. choices, options. Uh, we tour internationally, so we go to Europe and Australia, a lot of places all over the planet. So we're able to take different instances of our rig and I.O. and still do a show on even the small C-1500s uh, that we own and uh, love them all. And they all sound the same. It's the same desk, same workflow. Um, it's just a great option for us to use. Did you start off on a D-Live? As far as? I'm assuming you didn't start off in digital, you started off in analog? No, no, assuming? I was an analog user for okay. many, many years. Uh, I started touring in about 1996. Um, so I came up in the analog world. Large format, old school desks. Uh, used the occasional Allen and Heath back then, but a long time Yamaha Midas user. 4Ks, XL4, XL3, XL200. Uh, my first large format Yamaha desk was a PM1800 when I worked at Opryland uh, back in Nashville when I was in college and mixed shows out there and a lot of Crest consoles in that era. So a lot, so of, a lot of analog. What so. were you on before the D-Live? Before the D-Live, we were on Pro 2s, Midas Pro 2. Okay. Before that, uh, XL4, I had gone back to an XL4 after coming to the digital realm for a while. Uh, we had some uh, serious uh, crashes, so it led me back to the analog world. Went back to analog for about five years before we were doing an overseas tour, and I wanted to not have to go for a week of prep before a tour started, so we chose the Pro 2 and, and adopted that for about a decade. All right, for this run, how many inputs are you running? I think at front of house, I'm seeing just about a little over 60 inputs total. Monitor world, there's a few more for extra stuff, but... Uh, about 60 ends. And how many are the, of those are redundant? Uh, not many, they're, they're all single source, different use pieces that we do. Um, spares are built into that, but they are active lines and coming to us at all times. And I do not see any um, screens here. No. Waves, UAD, any of that? No. All native. We are all native in the box here. The only thing I use externally outside of the console is the 5045. That seems to be the common thing that everybody uses. Um, I use Lake for system drive, uh, smart system for tuning and alignment and uh, reference. And uh, yeah, nothing outside the box. Everything's in the good old desk. Can you walk us through some of the uh, plugins you use? Sure, I don't use any technical plugins on anything. Um, I'm a pretty basic mixer, old school analog in my workflow. I do a left-right mix right to my VCA modules and that's it. Um, standard EQ cuts for basic snare, you know, a little top end on that, hi-hat. A lot of my stuff is pretty flat uh, as a whole, high-pass, low-pass filters. Um, we've got a little bit of standard comp on the, with a 160 inserted on the, on the kick drums. And my snares are all the same. Um, this one I just use for a little thud, the 52. I don't use it and rely on it heavily. I just use it as an extra source. Um, bass guitars, same thing, 160. I'm an old school guy. Grew up on these things in 900 series racks that are now becoming Vogue. But I use the original ones that had compressors and gates in them. And it was a cool thing even back then. They still sound really, really close to the original use uh, pieces. So I, I've kind of gone and aligned myself with them in the desk. Uh, different opto compressor for the other bass input. Uh, on my saxes, I use the LA-2A. I just like the saturation level that I get with that. Um, guitars, I do have the VU version. Sometimes they're active, sometimes they're not. I don't use them on everything. Um, I've got them on one of my guitar of the two inputs that I typically use out at front of house. Vocals are all LA-2As. Um, on my vocal group where I have the 5045 bust in. I do use the stereo bus compressor 
but I like to keep filtering so I don't have to smash everything to death. I can keep uh, just the meat of the vocal compressed and still let the S's fly and the low stuff when he, he has very poor mic technique. So uh, 5045 is my, I live and die by that thing, primary source enhancers, period. It's, it's a great thing. It's a very live stage because we have active amps on stage, uh, drum kits live. Probably the coolest thing is we don't have one thing that's pre-recorded in our show at all, except the walk-on when the guys come on stage. So there's no playback, there's no tracks. You hear it live. Everything you hear is what they're playing. Um, there is nothing uh, that's coming through any kind of playback device or enhancement. It is whatever's coming out of that guy's fingers, hands, mouth. You're going to hear it with all the mistakes or perfection. So. So you say you're kind of old school with stuff. Do you do any like parallel compression stuff? Any secret no. tricks you got up your sleeve? No, man, I'm, I'm an old school guy. I, I double uh, input the main vocal mic so I get eight bands of EQ on him. Uh, he's very interactive with the crowd, so he talks a lot to the front row. So front fills are a big, big, big part of my tuning process. I make sure that the people in the front row who usually paid the most money for those seats can really, really hear what's going on. Can hear him interact with them. He's uh, He's, he's a very personable person, so when he's speaking to the crowd, I'll make sure that everybody can hear everything he says. So tell me about your, uh, your tuning process. Do you do pink noise? Do you do a song? What, what, what's your <coughs> process with it? Because <coughs> you're pretty I, much uh, PA du jour on this. For the right? most part, yeah. We do carry PA uh, for those occasional dates that we want to hang or we need to hang. Um, on this tour leg, we're, we do mainly theaters, and under 3,000 seat rooms is kind of the main uh, bag for this, this tour. Um, festivals, of course, are larger rooms occasionally with other bands or other things we have going on, but most of the time it's under 3,000 seats or that 2,500 and under spot 15 to 25. Um, so we are PA du jour most of the time, so we get a lot of time on a lot of different PAs properly and improperly deployed and uh and it makes things interesting but it keeps our chops up as well uh, for my tuning process i do use pink noise as alignment i use smart for only alignment and spl measurement for myself just to keep myself in check i'm not a target curve guy i have some but i don't really live and die by that uh, mixing this band as long as i have i i try to predict what's going to happen with experience-based uh, uh, choices rather than using software only. Uh, I live and die by my ears. Yes, we get up, we ride a bus every night, sometimes we fly, but mixing as long as we have this band, I spend a lot of time kind of priding myself on using my ears. If something doesn't, it can look right all day long on the screen, but not one person is going to come back here and look at my smart screen and go like, oh, man, that's perfect. They're going to go, what does it sound like? So live and die by the ears. Make sure that everything feels right. Uh, feeling is a big part of what we do. We, we can convey emotion for the band to the, to the fans. So we have to make sure that things feel good, sound good, so that they feel good, sound good, react, the band performs better, so on and so forth. Uh, what, what mics are you using for your RTA mics? Uh, just the good old RTA 420s from... Uh, from uh, Rational Acoustics right now. So DBX rebranded, if you will. <laughs> so that's all it is. It's a DBX mic that they wrap their thing on. So they work fine. I'm not, like I said, I don't live and die by measurements. So everything that I do is more based on just getting alignment, get everything tight, and I still walk and I'll still move things around at, even though, because when you're measuring, you're only getting one reference at one place at one point in time under one uh, particular humidity, sound's only gonna travel so fast at that point. So we have to make a lot of uh, averages. So I could spend all day measuring every space in here and it's all gonna be different. And where are, you gonna, where are you gonna hang your hat? I still have to stand here and I still have to mix from here. So if I can't make it sound good here, I'm screwed to try to make it sound good anyplace else. How'd you get into running sound? I was a musician like most people. Uh, started playing guitar at like nine years old. Had my own band when I was a young man, uh, growing up in Texas, and uh, my parents bought me a PA for my band, and I learned how to operate it. Uh, went to school at Belmont in Nashville, uh, right out of high school, and uh, I fell in love with sound reinforcement. I just took the class just to get more knowledge while I was going to school, and um, I loved my professors at that time. They were just killer people, real people who worked in the business 
every day, which made a big difference for me because I, I enjoyed their the stories of the road, the things that they got to see, the things that they did. I mean, a lot of our class time was talking about food, of all things. So we talked about, you know, okay, we went and did this gig so-and-so with such and such artists in such and such city. But I got to tell you about this great taco place that's right by the venue, you know. So that became uh, just a kind of a, a unique experience for me. And I loved every bit of it. I love the power that a fader can give you and the emotion that you can convey for a fan to feel a show. Because if this thing dies and goes to hell in a handbasket, nothing's happening. Yeah. We can always turn on the house lights and do a show. But if the PA doesn't work, there is no show. What's the uh, best piece of advice you've gotten from one of your mentors? Oof, boy. Um, have fun. Have fun out here. It's, we all work hard. Everybody works hard. It doesn't matter what hat you wear on a crew. You're all working hard. You're all working for the greater benefit of one show uh, to happen. But if you're not having fun out here, it's, it's not worth doing. If you're miserable, go home. Stay home. You know, take every gig you can do, do every gig you can do. Um, experience is invaluable as, as, as you move through life. Uh, the experiences are the things you remember, so. Uh, I think one of the most common questions I get is uh, how do I get involved and who's hiring? I keep getting that all the time. So if somebody wants to be running sound for a band like this, doing theaters like this, how do they do it? Go to your local music store. Local, local music store. Yes, those do people those, still do those do. still exist. They still exist. Go to that store. Go to your local production company. Find out who's doing shows in your area. Go to the churches. Churches are always hurting for people. It's a great place to hone your craft, work on your chops. Um, you get a lot of remedial, basic knowledge from those places, and that's that's a a market that always needs help. Um, you can always learn a lot from those spaces. Um, and you meet great people, network. Don't be afraid to, to tap on somebody's shoulder who is mixing and say, you know, I, don't, I wanna be in this business, how do I do it? Ask everybody you know, anybody you see, touring guys. We're all uh, looking for people to replace us eventually because we're not gonna live forever, you know? Uh, the guys out here with gray hair know a lot of stuff. You know, uh, we've all been out here a long time. We've done a lot of venues in a lot of different places, a lot of different bands, and you will uh, garner a lot of knowledge by those folks. You can go to the schools. The schools are great. It's a great way to get some fundamental assistance and fundamental uh, things in your head to kind of keep into, into play. But the, the best thing you can do is experience and being out in the field. All right, let's talk microphones a little bit. Okay. Uh, what microphones are you using for this? Can you show us? Sure. Absolutely. Let's go stage right, I guess. All right, let's talk mics. What do you got, my man? All right, 91 mounted inside on uh, a Kelly Chu system that keeps the thing floating right in the middle of the drum so we don't have to move it every day. 52 on the outside uh, for a little extra thud when needed. Uh, Bayer 201 currently on the top. Good old Beta 56 down below. Pardon everything's dirty. It's uh, three days left and this tour's over for the year. So 81 on the hi-hat. 32 is for overhead, the splash series that I spoke of here. Uh, he does a lot of little trills and things and triplets with his snare, I mean with his uh, cymbals. 137 underneath on the ride. We have a spy mic here, which is a, just a 98, Beta 98. So the band, all the band is on ears. George is still on wedges and side fills, so, so the band can hear him so they don't have to pop ears out when he comes back here to communicate a lot. Um, AT25 HEs, these are the silver anniversary model of this microphone. It's been my long time choice. It sounds like a drum instead of a high and low kind of click and a bunch of dump on the bottom. So it sounds really good and you can beat it with a stick. Not that he does, but uh, microphones on the guitar cabinets were 32s. We've been long time proponents of KSM 32s on guitars. On this tour leg, we decided to add a Royer 121 and an SM57 combo as an alternative, just because we're always looking to up our game as, as best we can. 
This is on George's cabinets here. It's almost mimicked exactly on the other side of the stage for the rhythm player. As you can see, 32, 121s, 57s. Vocal mic for background singer, 58, or KSM9 on the lead vocals now. Um, and that's really it for uh, microphone choices. Nothing super uh, weird. Our, our DI choices are basic JDI stuff. Uh, we're not doing anything real fancy. Uh, we take clean lines from both guitar rigs, which is different. Uh, right out of the wireless and run it line level all the way to front of house. And in front of house, I have pedals that I can use to supplement or change the guitar sound on my own without bothering the techs or having the tech change something for the player who likes a certain sound out here. I can get a different sound out front. Mix match, uh, we end up with about seven guitar options to pick from for each guitar player and each guitar sound. So kind of something different and unique. So let me ask you this, with um, ears, sometimes people complain of a boxed in feeling. There's not much here. The sound over on the stage is sound way different than the sound up over Absolutely. here. How do you uh, achieve that sound for these guys? Because there's all, what it looks like it's just going to be just drum sounds through up here. Right, well all these cabinets are live, so they're using all those. Okay. Uh, and then all the guys are on ears on the back side except GT. And then Colton has a series of mics out downstage for room feel. So he uses an SM27 and we place these out in various places depending on the environment. Um, so we use that for extra sound for these guys to give them an ambient feel. We've also got 27s like here. So this player gets a little bit more of his cabinet sound from back this way and he can feel what's kind of happening in normal stage volume without being completely closed in. Can you explain where these are? These are the and side the fills. Of them. Um, George doesn't use wedges anymore. We decided to just do a side fill implement since he won't wear ears. He's just an old school guy and that's understandable. It's a different feel for him. So we started deploying side fills. We've always used them as a supplemental uh, fill box to kind of incorporate into certain spaces, uh, but we've gone to exclusively just driving side fills. Uh, we're currently using RCF 9004 subs, which is a single 18 box, and then an HDL 26 pair of those on top. Uh, it's a double six with a three inch driver on top. So all RDNet controlled, where Colton, the monitor engineer, can time align anything he wants, shape any sounds that he needs for the, for the artist. What do you say separates a good audio engineer from a great audio engineer? Uh, these. The computers are great, but computers fail. These are always with you. Uh, they'll always tell you the truth. They might be jaded, but uh, the computer is a great reference tool. I, I think that's the biggest thing that most people rely on the computer. And smart. I always say that smart can make you really dumb. Uh, it's... It's a, it's a tool, use it as a tool, just like any console. They all sound the same, or they all do different, the same thing basically, different ways, and it's how you adapt to that tool to do the job. So it doesn't really matter what console, well, we have consoles of choice that we like or prefer, but they all do the same thing. They all have a gain knob, they all have a high pass, a low pass now. There's an EQ, there's a compressor, there's delay you can put in the desk, and then you consolidate it all into an output. So. They all do the same thing. Once you learn how to run one, it's just repeated time and time again. So learn how to use those tools, listen with those tools, learn what key filtering does is a big thing as a front of house guy, I believe. Most people are not taught or understand how to use key filtering to trigger effects or to trigger uh, gates or compressors or those kinds of things. Um, it's, it's a lost art on key filters. Us old school guys had key filters for everything back in the day, so it was wonderful to be able to learn how to use those tools and adapt them to the digital medium now. So I have a lot of uh, seasoned engineers and techs that watch my show, and I've got a lot of people who know nothing about it, that they understand that there's, a, there's an audience here and then there's a stage here. Mm -hmm. Could you possibly explain the different worlds that are back here? I, you and I both know what monitor world is, guitar world, and could you maybe show us that and explain what that is? Absolutely. 
So everything that you see on stage, a lot of times you'll see monitor speakers out or what the old guys called fold back systems, which means their speakers laid on their backs to blow back at the player. The players, while they still are playing that instrument in their hands, they still have to hear it at a certain level to understand how to play with the other guys on the band. So everything that happens on, on stage here that they're listening to either in their ears, you'll see things in their ears that are like hearing aid, looking devices. They're ear monitors, just like your AirPods, but they're wired or wireless to a pack. And then there's a monitor engineer back here who mixes all of those inputs for the guys playing on stage. So Colton is our monitor engineer on this tour. And so this is his world. And like currently he's listening to the show we did last night. Uh, via virtual sound check, which means all the things that the guys played last night were, is recorded onto a computer, and he's walking around listening to that right now, making sure everything sounds. Sure that. We don't have any interference by using Wireless Workbench, which is a program I'm sure he'll explain a lot more in depth because that's his job, um, not mine. So he can come in here and make adjustments for the guys, but this is the real time player, what's happening at showtime. Uh, as you get in the audio business, you'll learn that musicians during sound checks don't play anything like what they do when they're playing a show because the energy level is different. So this is a mimic of that. While we're missing the sound that's coming off the stage, they're still getting the majority of the things that he needs. He can improvise based on that, on his experience level. Guitar techs? Let's do it. All right, we've got one that's kind of a guitar tech. <laughs> now, we, uh, over the years, this, this is, uh, we've hired guys that have been very, very, very well qualified. So they've been able to handle more than just one person, uh, or my guys are not as dependent on the tech uh, going forward. So. We downsize the position from three guys to two guys to one guy now. So one guy handles all the back line on stage. Um, and Mike is in with us right now. Our normal guy that's been here the last uh, five or six years had to leave the tour for an emergency. So Mike used to be with us for about a decade or better. So now he's come back to help us out. But he tunes all the guitars for the guys, makes sure all of George's amps are working properly, um, tunes the drum kit, all of those things. So he takes care of all the players on stage for their instrumentation themselves. So. I think a lot of people think that the artists just go and grab and tune their own stuff and don't no. realize that there's an no. entire person back here that takes Absolutely. care of all of that. And for George's stuff, he's, he plays slide guitar, so he has a lot of open tunings, different styles of tuning. He's a very different style of player. He doesn't use a thumb pick like most people, or a flat pick, I should say. He uses thumb picks and finger picks. So he kind of picks banjo style, which is a very unique style of playing guitar. Uh, so it takes a different kind of dude to put up with those kinds of uh, details that he, that he deals with. So um, his whole world is here. I think right now we're only using seven guitars on this tour. Only um, seven. <laughs> only seven right now. So there's two standards. There's two D tunings. There's three G tunings. Uh, and that's the three tunings that he typically plays in on tour. Um, this is his pedal board. And Mike runs this all off stage. Uh, Mike also has a mixer of his own or a controller for his ear monitor. So instead of having to ask Colton, hey, can you turn up such and such? He can go through his own mix and build his own mix. So it's one less thing that Colton has to deal with, but he can also solo each individual input on stage right from his controller without it eating up a mix. It literally is it's his own thing and it's just POE. This is an IP6 by Allen and Heath. Um, and Colton can go through some more details, but he can turn up our talkbacks if we're talking about things. He can check tunings while the guys are playing. He can solo up each cabinet and say, oh, this one has a little fuzz to it. We're going to change that or change the guitar because of tuning issues. He can do that without having to ask the monitor engineer, am I in tune or is, is uh, the rhythm guitar player out of tune? Is the bass sharp or flat? He can make all those assumptions right here. So the musician will not actually hit the pedals. He will hit the pedals for, for him. For George, yes. Uh, Mike does it here all off stage. Um, Jimmy. Jimmy. Um, he'll run everything for George. George is busy entertaining the crowd. That's his role. So Mike handles all that stuff off stage for George, make sure that he has the appropriate amount of feedback or a certain effect that he wants for a certain part of the show. Uh, while Jimmy, the guitar player, mans his own pedal board on stage, 
Um, we kind of do things different. While we have these beautiful dual showman fender heads placed everywhere, they're dummy cabinets or dummy heads for us. Uh, the cabinets are live, but we use a solid state power amplifier off stage, and that's how we get our sound. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you, sir. Yeah, man. Let's do a little tour of um, Monitor World. All right, I've got Colton now mic'd up. All right, here Colton, we are. Colton, what do you do? I mix monitors. What does that for... mean? It means I do way more than anybody else. No. Okay. So I mix lots of mixes, uh, it's a separate mix for every band or every band member, all the guys in the band. So they all get where Jeff mixes one mix for the crowd. I have separate mixes of all the audio inputs to the guys so that they can hear what they need to hear on stage. How'd you get into this? Uh, started when I was very young. I was always a tech person. Um, I was into computers. I was into music as a drummer. Um, started in church with this like little Mackie analog 32 channel thing with the, like the youth band used. And then I played drums in church and then went upstairs and was on the Soundcraft, you know, as I was getting towards uh, the end of high school. I feel like every church had a Soundcraft. All of them, and they all <laughs> failed. All the power supplies failed. You know, that was a thing with the big old analog Soundcraft stuff. But um, so did that. Then the summer after I graduated, I did um, this thing called Drum Corps. I, I marched uh, snare drum and just like the NFL of like marching bands, like what it was. So I've been touring literally ever since. As a started as a player, and then now a tech person. Ever since I graduated high school. And the obvious um, trajectory for a. a Drum core is monitors. Absolutely, yeah, that's how that always works. But I did that for a while. I started doing audio for them, um, and then I did audio for the uh, different drum core group called the Blue Coats. Uh, mixed front of house for that. That was a crazy thing. It's and like, did they have blue coats? Uh, they didn't when I was there. They switched to costumes, so that, that was a big, <laughs> that was a big thing. Um, but um, I did that. I mean, it was like a hundred and. 20 inputs live all the time, all kinds of wire, like 60 channels of wireless, constant, um, doing big stadiums, doing that. Um, so that was obviously like in the band world. I worked with, uh, I apprenticed actually for a guy that worked for Roland Pro AV. Um, awesome guy. Uh, he would put me on, they had that M5000 console. He would put me on uh, events or gigs where they just needed somebody else to kind of, hey, we're going to do a sales event and like we're giving these people a console to get, you know, um, media coverage or whatever, saying, hey, somebody's using it. And one happened where they were like, hey, we need a monitor guy for this guy named Tim Rushlow. I was like, okay, cool. I can, I can do that. Sure, I'll go do that. I'm thinking, Tim Rushlow, who is this guy? Okay, he was the front person for a band called Little Texas. Okay, so country, you know, five-piece band, all right, cool. Well, I show up and it's Tim Rushlow and his big band, and I'm doing big band jazz, mixing 20, like 22 mixes as a monitor guy, and I've never really done it before. It's like, just dove in the deep end. Okay, cool, I guess I can figure this out. So um, I did that. They didn't immediately fire me, so that was cool. They were great guys. <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> uh, and that was cool, so I did that. It was a little residency in Nashville, and then, uh, through that, I went, I was a house guy um, at a place called the Wild Horse in Nashville. Um, did front of house and monitors, liked monitors, met a lot of people. And then uh, inevitably when that ended, I met uh, Jeff and started working for a company called 242 Concepts, which supplies all the audio for this band. Um, started doing a couple little things here and there, helping those guys load trucks building pedal board pieces. Uh, I was doing all that kind of stuff for this band, not touring. And then uh, I was off doing a gig and um, COVID happened, off doing a gig and I got the call, hey, my monitor guy tested positive for COVID, so you're coming to mix monitors for us. Okay, cool, I'll be there tomorrow. Uh, mix monitors for a leg. They were like, we like having you around. You've obviously helped us, did great. You know, intermingled with the guys, great. Um, so I came out as a tech on the next run. Three days in, Jeff's wife had to have like emergency surgery. So they're like, for this run, you're mixing front of house. <laughs> All right, cool. So uh, first two runs with this band, I mixed both positions and 
And we went from there. Um, monitor guy was with the band for like 20 years. He was their recording guy as well, and he decided to retire. So it was kind of natural for me to step in and take the monitor spot. So it seems like monitors, uh, just as important as being able to do the mix, is being able to deal with people <coughs> as well and being able to deal with band members. Would Absolutely. you agree with that? Yes. So. A big thing is being personal with those guys, knowing those guys, knowing what they need, knowing when I get that look, or not even when they're looking at me, like when they, when I see that look on their face, I know what to do. Um, being ahead of that game, them knowing that you have their back. play as well and then the front of house guy's gonna be angry because stuff's off you know so uh, them knowing that I've got their back I'm doing everything that I can do to make them comfortable and send them out them knowing everything's gonna work and if something doesn't work I'm right there to help them and I'm gonna be there with them to get, get them through it it's very important all right, I see a lot of buttons. I see a lot of screens. Do you know what all the buttons do? I might. I kind of make it up every night. Can so, you uh, walk me through your equipment, what you got? Yeah, sure. So um, I use a, uh, we both now use, have made the switch to the Allen Heath DLive platform. So I use a S5000 Surface. Uh, we use DM0 mix engines. Um, there's no analog split. We kind of share all of that uh, through the Giga Ace platform. And, excuse me, and we actually have stage boxes and a stage rack on stage. And that's where all of the inputs on the stage come into. Can we see it? Yeah, sure. Let's walk out here. So behind these cabinets, this kind of hides back here. So we've got these little DX168 boxes. And that's 16 ins by eight outs per box, and you can chain them together. Uh, so it's basically one data line that comes back to my console, and I've got 32 ins by 16 outs. So everything kind of breaks out from here. It keeps everything kind of close, fairly neat. Um, and that's where all of our I.O. is. So that's, awesome. how, that's how it gets into my world over here. Um, so. Once all that comes to me, I split it off to Jeff's console, um, which is out front. He's on an S5000 as well. Um, and that's how we get all of our inputs. Um, Why the Allen & Heath? Man, the Allen & Heath has been super flexible. Uh, that's the, the biggest thing to me is that I can switch surface sizes. You know, I really like the S5. It's not too big. It's not too small. I got all the faders I need, all the layers that I need. Um, but a big thing, you know, this band is in their 50th anniversary year right now so most of this stuff goes like when we tour internationally uh, it's very important for me to have as as close of a rig as possible when we go outside of the country so all of this stuff goes we scale down a couple like i scale down work boxes that stuff goes in pelicans but i can just take the small surface i don't have to have all of this it's an extra case uh, for flying and shipping stuff you know i can strap the little surface on top and have all my miscellaneous stuff all really in one container and it goes uh, there's no file conversion the um they have expansion cards because i used to be a big avid guy i, I like the s6 got a lot of time on the s6l um, but like the dante capability had to be in the stage box it wasn't as versatile uh, the waves um because we use a waves card for recording um, is fantastic everything's 128 by 128 um, you can make it a big loop you can just send a single cable and get all kinds of different stage box options you're not restricted um, it's just versatile and that's what i really like and it doesn't it sounds good it doesn't um, i don't get the versatility and sacrifice sound or sacrifice effects or sacrifice bussing and how flexibility of how i use the surface um, I still get all of it, so that's why I go Allen Heath. So I heard no waves, all native. I run everything native, yeah. Walk yeah. me through what you're doing. Uh, not a bunch. So I keep it, I feel the simpler the better, personally. Um, less things to go wrong, but I do, like I said, I want to make the guys comfortable. So I've got, I like big snare sounds, so I have a snare verb, 
Um, and then I have a full on drum verb. Uh, my drummer likes to hear all of himself kind of almost in a, like a big room, you know, he likes it to kind of re reverberate the whole drum kit. So I've got that with a separate snare so I can get those really big snare sounds. Um, I have, uh, for my saxophones, I have a pitch shift. This changes a little bit during the show. It's uh, like right now, it's just like a plus four, minus four. Um, it's just to, just to give it a little twang. Um, Buddy, our sax player, is an amazing sax player. Uh, but his tone is very different from Hank. If uh, I don't know if you know anything about the Destroyers, but Hank Carter was the original saxophone player, and he had this huge, nasty tone uh, on his saxophone, and it was just, you know, this mean tone. Uh, Buddy's an amazing player. Just the tone is a little softer with Buddy. So I, um, I tune uh, this with the pitch doubler, and uh, really I can... Like on songs like I Drink Alone, where you get that big sax howl, um, I can really crank that up and get more of those tones out of the saxophone. Um, verb for him as well, he likes to be drowning in verb uh, in his ears for him, his instrument personally. Um, I have a slight guitar verb. My guitar player really hates wearing ears. He understands the benefits of wearing them and he wears them, but he doesn't, he likes listening in the, in the room uh, more than he likes wearing in-ears. So I use uh, lots of things to uh, make him feel like it's very open, um, including his reverb to kind of help him feel like he's in the room. And then I have a specific tap delay that I kind of tune in every day um, for how long the room is. So. When we do sound checks, he won't wear his in-ears for sound checks, uh, so he can hear what the room is gonna be like during the day. And then at the end of songs, you know, I kind of fine tune this for whatever room we're in. Uh, so I can throw that up and it actually gets a like you're actually in the room. Uh, makes him a little bit more comfortable. Uh, same thing for vocals. I have a verb just to make everybody feel like it's not George isn't singing directly into their ear. It's a little bit more open and uh, a tap delay for that. There's a couple of spots in the show where he has a, a tap delay effects on his vocals. So fairly straightforward, just lots of verbs and delays and a little pitch shifter. So. All right, you have no wedges. Is it a very clean stage? Very clean stage. How much yes. RF are you doing? What lots. are you using? Um, Walk me through it. We have 16 channels of RF. We don't use all of them all the time. Um, I've got four channels over in Guitar World for the boss. He's got four channels active. Uh, cool thing about the Sure units is that they can sum into outputs. Uh, all your channels are wireless. So we have four channels that are open all the time and they just come out of one output that go into his pedal board. All of this is networked by the way, so I can control it here. Um, additionally, I have another quad wireless Sure unit um, they also sum in, you can do four into a single output, or you can do like one and two sum and go into an output and three and four sum and go to an output. So I have my guitar player and bass player uh, that way in our stage rack, uh, right behind their cabinets. Um, that's so they can each have a pack, that's their main pack, and then a backup pack that's on, ready to go. All they gotta do is turn their volume down, grab the next guitar, turn their volume up. I think as Jeff was saying, they're pretty independent in how they deal with their gear. Um, our tech will tune everything for them and make sure it's ready when they walk up and at showtime it's ready to go. Uh, but typically they're, you know, they've got pedal boards, they've got tuners, they can kind of take care of themselves. So I give them a main and a spare pack that's ready to go. So if they needed to change or something, they can, something's wrong, they can just walk off to their vault right here, grab the other guitar, volume up, and they're good to go. Um, I have two quad ULXD units right here for my main vocal. Also have a channel for alto saxophone and tenor saxophone, so they're all wireless, they can run around. And then I've got another, which is just some uh, guest vocals. You know, sometimes we have guests that'll come out and sit in or do something, or uh, we deal with, very often we'll have like a solo acoustic opening act, um, and it's just easier for us to, you know, throw a vocal and a guitar up in the side fills instead of having to have another like a house desk back here um, so we'll use that and then i've got some simply spare lines that are set up for if i had like a sax go down i could grab a spare pack and 
send that out there with them. What band are you running? G50 on all of the wireless inputs and then on, I've got eight channels of PSM 1000 and X55, uh, which is up in the 900s. You gotta have your part 74 license for that. Okay, uh, so explain great. that a little more. So part 74 is like, uh, you gotta get a file with the FCC and it gives you permission basically to operate within that band. Um, we did it through uh, professional wireless. Like when you buy, there's a helical antenna that's it's like the normal clear helical that you see from PWS, but it's tiny because 900 is smaller wavelength. So like the uh, antennas here, much smaller. Typically you'll see them, but they're about that long. They've got a uh, yellow tip on them. These are red, smaller antenna. Can we see the helical? Yeah, sure. It's right here. Sit it right here on the guitar vault, pointing right on stage. So it's a little bit smaller than the typical PWS. Uh, but when you buy that through there, they say, hey, you know, are you just buying this or do you need, you know, the licensing and whatnot? And we said, we need to do all the licensing and everything. We're wanting to buy these, have a little bit clearer spectrum to work in. And they were like, all right, cool. It's a service that they do. You give them your info, they file the license for you and say, good to go. So there you go. Uh, so we're all on in the 900s on ears. It's super clear. Never had um, an interference problem up there. Just had to be careful because some water meters will use will be in the 900s. Really? The, uh, some hospital communications will be in the 900s. So that's why you had to have a license is so that you have to be aware of what's around you. Uh, a lot of times you'll have to coordinate with local frequency coordinators um, that deal with that. Uh, so that you can get permission to use certain parts. Uh, so you have to really know what you're doing there. But uh, as long as you do and you abide by all the laws, they're fantastic. They, um, they work great. And I scan even to, uh, I do a scan to, like, even when I do with locals, uh, local, let me scan out here. When I deal with like local coordinators and I get uh, frequencies I'm supposed to use. I just scan to double check and I mean look how clear that is <laughs> There's absolutely nothing the noise floor is so low um, This is actually a piece of wireless. That's like our LEDs in this rack and it follows me everywhere <laughs> But uh, that's the only peak that I got. Yeah, so so explain the different colored lines You got a red line you got an orange line. Yeah, so there's a bunch uh, of so I've got a lot of engineers who are seasoned that watch this But I've got some people who know nothing okay. about it. So could you explain kind of what we're looking at here? Yeah, sure. So basically let me go here um, Basically, this is a scan of the airwaves, right? So uh, this is what you can't see in RF uh, radio frequencies. So where this is blocked off right here, this is a TV channel. You can tell because it juts up, it's a digital TV channel, it juts up and it like plateaus and then it juts back down. So this is very obviously a TV channel. Um, you can go into spectrum here and go to TV channels and it will find, you put in the zip code or the GPS coordinates depending on where you are. I use this all over the world, multiple countries, literally 19 countries last year. You put in your GPS coordinates, it tells you what TV channels there are around you. Um, then my scan validated that. The TV channel uh, scanner marked this off and my scan validated that by showing me, hey, yeah, there's a TV channel here. So you wanna avoid that. Uh, this red line going across, that's basically the line that I pay attention to. It's basically saying, hey, if any thing is over this line, I don't want to put a frequency there that you're going to use. So I put this at minus 90 usually, which is quite low. Uh, usually with wireless workbench, it comes at minus 80, I think. Uh, you can even go up higher than that. Um, just kind of depends on what you're wanting to do. Uh, I put it at minus 90 personally because I know that when you assign and deploy, it gives you a star rating on your frequencies. So like here, I've got a couple of one star frequencies. So typically you, you want the three stars, you know, the better ones, uh, not just the, the one or two stars. However, I know that with, an, with this being so low, I know that even my one star frequencies are at minus 98, minus 100 on the noise floor. So I, even if it's a one star, I should be good uh, to put a frequency there. And there are some places, Phoenix, Arizona, 
uh, that the noise floor is completely over there. If you keep it at minus 90, you won't have any frequencies to use. So you got to adjust it day to day. Um, you know, it's kind of something that wireless I've learned a lot. I dealt a lot with it with the, the drum core thing I was telling you about. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we had literally 60 channels of wireless with all of the quad ULXD units, the Axiom units, the PSM units that we're using. Um, so you had to learn what was where and that you're moving two or three times a day. So you got to scan multiple times a day and calculate and everything. Uh, but um, that's generally what I'm looking for here is what's the scan look like? What is, uh, this is where I want it to be below. Uh, what does that noise for look like? And then I can place within here. And then when you analyze, you can see that everything is checking off green and showing I'm good. And what is this yeah. program you're using here? This is Wireless Workbench 7. Can't even see me. All right, what had happened here is Hold on. I'm an audio guy. <laughs> the battery died. I'm not a camera guy. I don't have a camera guy here. So we're going to get back to where we were before. Sorry about that, y'all. All right. Wireless Workbench. This is Wireless Workbench 7. It is. Wireless Workbench 6. Uh, works just the same. I basically use it for the wireless workbench 6 features. Um, I don't really use any of the new stuff. So it's been stable. I like the dark mode. It's great when you're you know, in dark theaters mode is life. And, it's, and it's dark. I live life by dark mode. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's how I take care of all the frequency coordination every day. So I take care of, uh, with the units scattered around, I take care of all the frequency coordination for everybody and then I'll send it out and let them know that wireless is good and they can uh, start syncing up their packs and, and all the guitar worlds and everything. I, I love the implement, impl wow, I love the implementation of your MEs, your personal monitor mixes. Oh, they're not MEs, they're just the controllers, they're IP8s. Oh, the IP8s, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So the, I love the application of your IP8s that you're using. The MEs are cool. They're like the little Avion pieces. These act like those. Uh, we have, I've got one that's the IP8, uh, and then there's one in Tech World over there, which is an IP6. It's got six knob encoders instead of eight faders. So this is just, in essence, personal monitor. It's, it's not even that, it's just a controller. So you can be anything on the DLive. Um, and the cool thing about the DLive is it has 10 PFL buses. So I reserve one as the monitor engineer, I'm PFL one. When I solo anything on the console or anything on this controller, it is it goes to PFL one, but I actually have PFL two assigned to my guitar tech. And he's got a controller, anytime he solos anything, it goes to PFL two, which is inevitably in his ears. Um, so that's how we can kind of separate those things. It takes all of that control of Hey, can I get this this in my mix? I'm having a hard time telling, you know, if he's in tune. Can I get this guitar on my right, this guitar on my left? I give control to the tech. They've got a piece there. They can solo any guitar. They can uh, give themselves more volume. They can push the button and pan however they want if they want it in different ears. Um, whatever they want to do, I just give the control over there, and it's all wireless because it's not an ME where all of the audio is in the unit. It's just a controller that you plug into the network. It's got PoE, so I send PoE to it, and it's just powered over one cable. Um, it still, the control is happening in my mix engine, in my console, and it's hitting their wireless pack and sending it over to him. So much simpler than, you know, me trying to mix something and then I'm getting, hey, can I get this in my mix? Hey, can I get that? You know, so it makes it, He's a little bit more self-sufficient at that point. All right, another question. Yeah. How can someone select good in-ears? That is a good question. So we use a mixture of in-ears. Um, right now, a lot of us are using Sensophonics, which are great. They're like molds. Uh, a lot of people do the like JH Audio, the Jerry Harvey stuff, Ultimate Ears. I have nothing against any of those companies. Um, I've had products from those companies. That's, they're great. They do a lot of drivers, which gives you, it requires more power and it gives you lots of control, uh, especially if you're like into like that audio file type mixing thing. Um, the Sysophonics are great because it's two drivers. It's a high and low, uh, or my bass player has a double bass loaded. So it's a three driver. So it's two bass, two lows and a high. Um, it's a little bit simpler. 
Uh, Dr. Santucci is behind Sensophonics. Um, he's a true audiologist. Is very uh, the whole slogan is respect your ears. So they're all about uh, hearing preservation um, and how that ties to like illnesses. Um, he was talking to me the last time I saw him. They're out of Chicago. We were doing a, sh a show outside of Chicago, um, and he was talking to me about how he's done studies about how. Hearing loss relates to early onset dementia and all this stuff. It's, it's very crazy, the research that he does. But it's, it's coming, you know, looking at in-ears from the perspective of a true audiologist, um, which is fantastic. These are not hard acrylic. They are soft rubber. So they move with you. They feel really good in the ear. Um, and he actually, they take into account how much space there actually is from the end of the ear to your eardrum, and this is where the audio mixes. You know, so that amount of space is very important to know and calculate in how this is going to sound. Um, there's another company that we use called ACS Technologies. Uh, they have a product called the Adele, which is uh, Doctor uh, or not Doctor uh, Stephen Ambrose is um, the guy behind that. Uh, but it's this thing that you put in your ear, and it actually inflates. It's made for older musicians that have lots and lots of hearing loss because it inflates and it actually acts like a false eardrum. You get about 90% of that um, audio coming through absorption uh, in your ear canal. Uh, it's fantastic. My drummer, he's about as deaf as this case. So, uh, you know, playing drums for 50 years. He is the original destroyer of George Thurgood and the Destroyers and he's been they play drums at Live Aid and just these massive shows where it's just so loud and he's got a lot of hearing loss. Uh, he has to wear hearing aids constantly. Uh, so that product has really helped him. It inflates, it moves with you whenever you talk and open your jaw, you get a fantastic seal out of it. Um, we were exclusively on those uh, and they're just, some of the guys wanted and preferred just a put in and not have to pump and do this kind of thing when they're trying to bounce around a bunch of instruments. So uh, that's fine. But my drummer and my guitar player specifically, who doesn't like wearing in-ears, he can, in he can deflate them a little bit and get more ambience uh, while also still getting good absorption from that bubble. Like the old so, Jordan pumps, but for your ears. Yeah, exactly. So there, I'm about, um, like, I love all the guys at those companies. I have no, like, we're not endorsed really by anybody. My job as a monitor guy for this band is to find the best thing that makes them comfortable. So if one product works, that's great. We're gonna go with that product. And if something else works for another guy, that's great. That's what we're gonna go. Um, I really like those Adele's. Like I said, we were exclusively on them for a while. I'm just, I'm dealing with more people. I've got managers over here. I've got the security guy asking me, hey, is that our camera that we put out? You know, and I gotta like say, oh no, that's somebody recording that didn't sign a release, you know, and so I'm constantly doing this. So it made it a little bit harder to have the pumps in, but for the guys that it helps, truly amazing product. So they're awesome. All right, we got two more screens to go over here. Oh yeah. I have a lot of screens because I'm ADD, like <laughs> crazy. If I don't have it in front of me, I forget. It goes completely somewhere else, out of sight, out of mind. So I have lots of screens up. Um, really, I work my console. Let me just go over, I'll grab that. Uh, I'll just go over the whole thing as a whole. Um, you can bank these so that, uh, like if I hit this button, you know, if these two were banked, they would both change. I have everything completely separated. Jeff has them banked where these are inputs, this is outputs. Um, I have everything separated. So these are my inputs as you go through. Um, this is my working area, right in the center of the console, right at my screen where I would be able to work on, you know, get to my utilities, get to my meter, see all of my important things. Uh, I mix all my DCAs, have things to, that I can throw to make different effects happen. And then these are my outputs. So I work very much left to right all the way through. Um, the tablet gives me basically my side fill mix and it's up all the time. So I'm one button away really from getting there, but just in case I needed to grab something, this is my side fill mix so I can go straight to it. Uh, with the tablet, it's also wireless. So when we're doing virtual sound check, I can take this and walk out and stand right exactly where the boss is gonna be. And 
make sure it's sounding exactly like it needs to sound. Um, so that's the tablet. Like we said earlier, the side fills are the only live cabinets on stage. I mean, there are guitar cabinets, but the live audio related cabinets. I don't have wedges, I don't have all that stuff. But everybody else is on ears except for George. So I wear ears for the majority of the time, 98% of the time in the show, unless I'm saying something to somebody, I've got to pull them out, or if I've got to talk to the band member that comes over and is saying something to me, uh, or if something sounds weird and I just pull them out to check the side fills. Um, other than that, I'm wearing my ears almost all the time. So I have this screen, which is set up to always be an RTA of what's coming through the side fills. So I can always at a glance see exactly what's happening in the fills. Um, if something starts to take off, like if it's going to feed back or something, it'll start to you know, come up. I've got it set to a bar graph that will rise. I can see it and I can very quickly react and make the appropriate change. Um, moving over, this uh, IP controller is just really my throw and go stuff. It's also a backup to my console, uh, my Surface, because all the processing in the Allen & Heath is actually in the mix engine down here. Uh, so I can actually turn this Surface off and in the middle of the show and nothing will happen except for I'll lose uh, my talkback mic. That's the only thing plugged into it. So this thing can completely power down and the show and audio keeps going. So this is set up completely separate. It's into a switch, power over ethernet. It's one, uh, one cable. So if I, for some reason, things started getting glitchy, which hasn't happened, um, but I'm a man of backups. Uh, if this for some reason started getting glitchy and I needed to reset it or it just wasn't working, I'm right here and I've got all of my DCAs that I mix my show on. Uh, I've got a couple of extra things that I can get to my outputs. Uh, and then I have a money layer, which is, this is always up because it's things that I grab often. Um, you know, the song Bad to the Bone has an alto sax uh, solo. It's the only song he plays alto on. So no matter where I'm at, no matter what I'm taking care of, I can reach over and unmute that alto when it's time. Uh, guitar tap delay, if I've got something else going on, I can very quickly make sure that I'm throwing that at the end of the song uh, to make him feel comfortable. Uh, some verb there, uh, drum vocal, which is his talk back directly to me. So when he, when I hear him say, hey, Cole 45, hear it in my left ear, I can solo that up and now I'm I can hear him and we're talking directly uh, if he needs something. Crowds is a DCA of all my crowd mics. I pump those in and out constantly throughout the show, again, in an effort to make sure that all the guys feel comfortable on stage. They're feeling the, as much ambience as they want. Um, lots of call and response that George does during the show. So I can pump that a little bit or a little bit more depending on you know what's happening. And then I've got this guy, which is a spy mic, which is, on the drum rack, actually, it's just a little Beta 98, the little AMP version. Um, George will just turn around and start talking to the guys. And he's not wearing in ears, and they are. So they can't hear anything. You know, it's all, they're isolated. But he'll just turn around and start talking. So I can just turn that up, it makes that mic live in their ears, and they can communicate very easily. So that's, that's there, so I can very quickly throw that. Um, but they're also doubled right here, so if I just needed to go a bank down, I can. Uh, and then this screen is my computers. So I have two computers, two Mac minis in here, uh, KVM'd, so that I can deal. One is a control computer. It, uh, it's what I do my wireless workbench on. If I need to get any um, into any of the gear that's networked, if I needed to log on to the front of house console and turn up some house music if we're like sometimes we're in a theater and it is you would be surprised how complicated it is to get from right here out to the front of house console it like takes 20 minutes to get there it's ridiculous so i can just log on to his console and turn house music up and we're good to go that's cool um i can get to the lakes i can get to any of the sure units anything that's networked basically i can get on this control computer and then when i switch over to my second computer it's a dedicated record so uh, transferring some files right here to uh, our bass player uh, who wanted some multi-tracks, but I've got running Reaper. Uh, it's an excellent program. I wasn't a fan at first. I'll admit, 
Everybody seems to like Reaper. I'm not going to judge you. I'm so. I was a Tracks Live judging person. You. Waves had Tracks Live. It was perfect. You just say, hey, I want to use that. It goes one to one. Record, great. Playback, great. Saves my files. I don't care. But then they stopped supporting it. So I was like, all right, I'll get with the times. Everybody wants Reaper. So uh, I will. Uh, everybody's using Reaper. So I'll jump to that and it's it's a pretty fantastic program i record a lot of stuff right now i'm playing back for virtual sound check um, i record almost everything in here i've got stereo channels i record uh, the front of house mix i record there's a front of house mix uh, in a matrix with audience mics so i record that um, i also record all of my mixes that i send out to the band so this is so hey Last night, I kept getting some popping in my ears. Okay, cool. Well, was that something in the console? Was that something that was happening in real time? Was it something in the pack in the wireless? Or was it something in the send? I can go back and listen and say, well, there's no popping or crackling here. So uh, there's no popping or crackling here. So that, that must have been in the wireless or something like that. So. Um, so that's uh, been really helpful that I can record all of that stuff uh, over Waves. So I do have a Waves card. Like I said, I don't use any outboard plugins just because I don't need it. So the simpler, the better. Lots of guitars going on. Um, the simpler, the better. If I needed it, I would use it, but I don't um, for what I'm doing. Uh, so I do have a Waves card, one Cat5, 128 in, 128 out. So it's super flexible um, that I can get all of that in and out on the computer. So, so yeah, that's kind of uh, the rig. One last question for you. What's up? What is the best advice you've gotten from one of your mentors? Whatever happens during the day doesn't matter. Um, you know, it's great that we set all this stuff up and we put all this time, but there's, there's only a couple things that are guaranteed throughout the show. It's the show's going to happen. There's going to be a settlement. We're going to load out. We're going to go to the next one. So it may be easy to get wrapped up in all this stuff and get wrapped up into what all this stuff that's going on. But um, ultimately, you know, we're cool as long as you're a good human being because being a good human being and hanging out and having personality and being able to interact with people, live on a bus with people, uh, make sure that people know that you're being, you're taking care of them. They're, you're not just over here pushing buttons and messing with them. Like you're actually taking care of them and you're there for them. Um, that's probably the best advice I've gotten. Just don't worry about it. Things are going to happen. You get off schedule, things get behind, something doesn't work. It's easy to get frustrated. This is the best job in the world. So, you know, don't stress it too much. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate yeah, your time. Absolutely.